Yeah, welcome to episode five of God Word Podcast. I'm your host, Casey, and uh, there was a request to do some Plato, so we're going to do some Plato today. We're going to do book two of The Republic. Um, I recently stumbled on a video of a guy, I think he was like an Episcopalian minister, believe it or not, and the video looked to be like 15 years old. So, I don't know, early 2000s or so. And he was saying that we, he meant Christians, we really need to, if we want to reintroduce Christianity, then we need to turn to mysticism. Yes, we need visionaries and seers. We need priests to be shamans. Somehow we need to tap into the Holy Spirit gifts to prophecy if we want to revitalize it. And for what it's worth, I agree. But of course, this show is about Plato. And I mentioned that video that I saw because I believe the same may be said for Plato. That if we want to save him, to make him worth saving, and really to understand him, I think, then we need to understand the mysticism that sort of undergirds all of his work. And we need to, like, find that in ourselves. The Republic, I think I'm right, has the capacity to alter consciousness. It's more than philosophy. Or rather, like, philosophy is supposed to be more than it in fact is, you know, as it's practiced in, like, college classrooms. Now, this is a pretty presumptuous claim of me to make. I I understand. I'm not, as I've said, a classicist, and I don't speak Greek. So how can I claim to find in Plato something that better qualified people have missed? Well, it's a long story, actually, involving, you know, Peter Kingsley's reading of Parmenides and E.R. Dodd's 1952 classic, The Greeks and the Irrational, as well as my own, yes, my own, mystical experience. And there are thousands, okay, (laughs) there are thousands of summaries of Plato's Republic online, but a solid 90% of them, maybe more, treat it as if it is a straightforward, demystified theory of political philosophy. I dissent from that view and I'm going to teach you to see it my way. I believe that what is political in Plato's Republic is there almost by accident. And it is in Book 2, which is what this episode's all about, that I think I find one of my best warrants for that claim. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do episodes on Books 6, 7, and 8 of Plato's Republic to follow up on this episode, and... In some of that content, I will no doubt slip into casually discussing the politics of those chapters. Because in those books, Socrates is completely in the political analogy, okay? But if you can really stick it in your head, what you're about to hear in this episode about book two, you may understand that those later chapters are actually happening on two levels. Ultimately, Plato's Republic is about mo- mo- sorry, is more about virtue and happiness, like in the individual. It's about psychology more than it is about politics. When I say short digression here, like when I talk about rediscovering the mysticism here, what do I mean? I I mean I look like um, I mentioned Peter Kingsley on Parmenides, like these. Like, the pre-Socratics, okay, the the earliest Greek philosophers, were undoubtedly mystics. If you don't believe me, Google Parmenides' one, like, extant surviving writing called, I think it's called On Nature or Of Nature, and try to read it. I mean, it is deeply mystical, esoteric, uh, symbolic, sort of, you know, it, it, it deal. It's like, it is not... It, it, well, anyway, this guy is called the father of philosophy sometimes, Parmenides. But he is nothing like these, uh, <clears throat> you know, these uh, elbow-padded, sport-coat-wearing, like, turtleneck philosopher guys that pass as philosophy professors. 
And philosophy, at least until the time of Plato, was not something that one did, you know, sort of like for a living as like a job, like reading books and, you know, being smarter than everyone. That is not what philosophy was. Philosophy genuinely was a kind of initiatory, almost essentially, you'd be not be wrong if you thought of it like a religion. It was like a religion. It was meant to, like the term that Peter Kingsley uses for these, for philosophers in the pre-Socratic phase was, is iatromantis. And an iatromantis is one, is like the word I think is related to like midwifery or something. That's what Socrates calls himself too. That there's this, that what we're trying to do is to usher one into a new level of consciousness. Okay. That is what philosophy is supposed to be. It's not just some ideas that you memorize because you read a book. Okay. It is a fundamental change in consciousness. Now in Plato, this gets really interesting. Okay. Plato himself was born around 427 BC, which you'll remember is right in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. And so like life during that time was, you know, as I said in I think episode one or two, like all up in the air, everything was changing. And one of the things that changed in the Athenian school right around, and so like, you know, you can think, I mean, I think this is like the first famous triad of, you know, philosophers and students where it goes like Socrates was sort of the mentor and teacher of Plato, and Plato was the mentor and teacher of Aristotle. But in that group, something remarkable shifts, and it is around the point of writing. Okay, Socrates himself didn't write. Plato did, but of course, like, only wrote, see, not only, but mostly only wrote to record what Socrates said. It's as if Plato wanted to use writing, but only to record the, like, oral transcripts. Like, it, it was, you know, it, it was, writing at that point was almost like a new technology. It was like, what are we supposed to do with this? Now, that's probably not totally fair. I mean, for instance, Plato didn't write down many of these dialogues, the Republic in particular, until, like, 25 years after Socrates was made to drink the hemlock. So, surely... There's a certain amount of like literary and almost fictional element to what he's doing. But the point is that in just two generations, from Socrates to Aristotle, you go from a guy who didn't write, being the the like archetype of the philosopher, to I mean, who wrote more than Aristotle? Like Aristotle is one of the most like dense writers in the ancient world. I mean, this guy just piled up words. And so writing became sort of the norm during this transitional period. But I want you to think about Socrates himself in this period, a guy who is said to have been penniless. He was ugly. He wore the same clothes every day. He didn't even like his wife. And he didn't write anything down. Like, this is our guy. This is the philosopher guy. So I, I'm not sure exactly what to make of that, but I think the idea of like philosophy being a transformative experience, experiential sort of a thing, I know that can be kind of an annoying thing to hear, but something that's supposed to like do more to you than just reading an average book. I think that this is more accessible probably if like if you're standing face to face with this long white bearded guy who's not wearing shoes and he's probably got crusty toenails and he keeps bugging you about everything you say and you in, in that experience you're going to understand better that this is like something happening to you more than if you just sort of um like casually have a copy of Aristotle next to your bed and read it every couple nights right that's a different thing so what like what I'm saying here is that I mean I don't think like p- I mean people it's like people rarely cannot understand a speaker in their own language right it's pretty you can't it's like face to face you you're like I get it and if you don't you ask for clarification but with writing it gets more complicated if you give it 300 years or so you know misunderstanding seems to become almost the norm like try reading David Hume or something but you know 
So part of what I'm saying here is that with Plato, we need to try to take in his writing like as a whole and not just any particular excerpt, okay? I heard this Radio Lab podcast a while ago where the challenge was, what if you had to try to communicate something to people 10,000 years in the future? And the idea was about some part of the desert out in New Mexico where they're burying radioactive material. And so, like, how can we signal to people 10,000 years from now not to, like, build a village there because it'll be bad for them, you know? Well, it's not easy. It's not actually easy. You can't just write it in English. English will certainly be defunct by then and probably impenetrable. And so, do you use emojis and scary faces or, like, what do you do, right? And so, if you want to write something down to record it for posterity so that it's, like, eternal, I think that you're better off writing kind of a big heap of stuff and hoping that your readers will take in the overall gist of it, rather than like, you know, the quotes on goodreads.com or something. So that's sort of my caution. Anyway, okay, geez, what an intro, sorry. In case you've never read it, a very brief summary of book one of The Republic, it's a kind of literary setup which introduces the main characters and shows Socrates walking home from some religious festival and running into some old guy and asking him what it's like to be old, And then eventually the conversation turns to a question of justice. And justice is real close to goodness, I think, in this book. So if that word is easier for you, that's probably okay. You know, okay, so the definition, like what it is, uh, is it good, why is it better than injustice, all those sorts of things. And this is the part featuring the cynical Thrasymachus, or Thrasymachus, who makes the claim that injustice is better than justice, and that the unjust man will always have more than the just man, and therefore be happier. Socrates sort of confounds Thrasymachus by saying that the real benefit to virtue and justice is happiness, not material possessions, and that wretchedness follows doing injustice because conscience, basically, something like that. But Socrates feels like he still doesn't have a really good definition of justice, And Thrasymachus, he sort of just leaves, not wanting to hear any more of it. He's too cynical for this whole process. And so that brings us to book two. I guess the first lesson there is, if you don't have patience and you're not genuinely interested in the truth, this isn't going to be your your game. The dialectic is not for you. But here, in chapter two, book two, the one we're going to cover today, a guy named Glaucon takes over. And he indicates that it's going to take a lot more to convince him than it did to sort of perplex Thrasymachus. Glaucon wants to believe that doing justice can be valued both for itself and for the consequence it brings. But he says he'll need to be convinced, and so he's going to argue as rigorously as possible for injustice in hopes that Socrates can form a crushing argument in favor of justice being a good in itself and for its consequences. Uh, A word here about in itself versus for its consequences. This is an important distinction. Example, our delight in music is a good in itself. That is, we don't delight in music to get paid or to become popular, or for some other reason. We like music for what it is. The liking is the point of it. By comparison, most of us don't go to work or help our wives with the dishes like, like just as an end in itself. No, we do it for the consequences. That is, we don't love doing this stuff, but it sort of gets us to where we want to be. The distinction is important because Socrates is making a pretty remarkable claim that doing justice is, or doing good, is good not just for the consequences it brings us to, but also in itself. And this last part is a bit surprising. How can we make this important distinction clearer? Well, suppose, Glaucon says, that we give each of two men, one, one of them, all good, but thought by people to be bad, and the other man, all bad, but thought by people to be good, okay? We're going to give each of these guys a, a magical ring, this is the ring of Gyges, 
the ring that allows them to become invisible and and plausibly do whatever they want, you know, steal, rape, pillage, and, and so on. In making his case for injustice, Glaucon makes these two perfect archetypes, the good guy and the bad guy, uh, and he does this so that the contrast is as strong as possible. And he says that the just man who could get away with doing injustice, but who chose not to, would seem totally wretched to anyone who became aware of his justice. And, and Socrates says, although they would praise him to, sorry, Glaucon says, although they would praise him to each other's faces, deceiving each other for fear of suffering injustice. Ha <laughs> ha. In other words, like, you know, they would say he's doing great, but really they're just afraid that he'll make himself invisible and sneak into their house and take their toaster or whatever. <clears throat> and listen to this. Glaucon goes on to describe what will happen to any just man who refuses to use his invisibility powers to do injustice. Quote, they'll say, the just man who has such a disposition will be whipped. He'll be racked. He'll be bound. He'll have both his eyes burned out. And at the end, when he has undergone every sort of evil, he'll be crucified and know that one shouldn't wish to be, but to seem to be just or good. End quote. Wow! Remember, this was written 375 years before Jesus Christ was crucified, but it sounds almost prophetic. Of course, I mean, a side note, you know, this was written probably 25 years after Socrates was essentially crucified or made to drink the hemlock, right? So, Maybe that's the import here. Okay, here Glaucon's brother Adamantus breaks in to strengthen the argument for injustice. He says, quote, Fathers say to their sons and exhort them, as do all those who have care of anyone, that one must be just. However, they don't praise justice by itself, but the good reputations that come from it. They exhort their charges to be just so that, as a result of the opinion, ruling offices and marriages will come to the one who seems to be just. End quote. And you guys, this is actually heartbreaking. I mean, I wonder if any of you truly understand this and believe that this is the situation, because it is heartbreaking. The idea that you tell your children to be good but really, deep down, you're only telling them that because you want them to be thought good by the world so that they can have access to power and good marriages and money and so on. If seeming, seeming rules the world, then life is almost nothing but a curse for the truly just man who doesn't simultaneously take care to also seem just. I heard someone in a video yesterday <clears throat> while I was show prepping describe this terrible reversal. He said, quote, Imagine if Mother Teresa is the unjust person with a just reputation, and Adolf Hitler is the just person with an unjust reputation. And it's actually an, like a very apt setup, because that's just who Glaucon is imagining. The one with the angelic reputation, and the one with the demonic reputation. But he, he sort of begs us to think, what if their true natures are misunderstood? I mean, what a terrible reversal that would be. And would anyone, would anyone raise their child to be just if they knew that the reward in this world for being just would be that that child would be thought to be Hitler by everyone around him? I mean, what a tragedy this is, right? Okay, now, of course... Maybe you want to object to this and wiggle out of it and say, well, surely not every man who does justice gains a reputation for injustice. I mean, this is like an extreme case. Well, I hope you're right, you know, but think of the people the world does actually esteem as just. In fact, think of Mother Teresa. I mean, great example, right? Like, she was synonymous with goodness when I was growing up. But then didn't we read just a few years ago in her unauthorized biography that she was... I don't know, really an atheist who was chronically depressed or something like that. 
So maybe the inner didn't match the, or the, like the, yeah, the inner didn't match the perception. I mean, maybe that's just one case, but think of all of our politicians, the ones we vote for because we think they're decent and just and caring. What if behind the scenes, they're in it for themselves? They're jaded, power hungry, and simply using voters to acquire more wealth and notoriety for themselves and their families. I mean, does this really seem inconceivable? On the other hand, is it possible to imagine a sort of man of virtue who seeks only the truth, who cares nothing for fame or power? Dostoevsky tried it in his novel, The Idiot. Wouldn't this person seem a kind of idiot? And that's the point of that book. Just change one little shibboleth from society on this sort of naive truth seeker. And all of a sudden he, trying his damnedest to keep track of the truth in life, only seeking the truth, he will be relabeled, you know, hateful, bad, and unjust by society. Someone play the violins here. I mean, damn it. You know, life is brutal. A prophet is never recognized in his hometown. It's actually sad. And nobody really cares, you know? <laughs> I mean, LOL. Anyway, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make you understand the point here. If any of you ever have felt like you tried to do the right thing and got nothing but some rotten eggs for it thrown at you, I mean, maybe, maybe you'll understand the point here. Anyway, this is, <clears throat> by the way, this is the distinction that philosophers used to draw between the categories philosopher and sophist. It used to be well understood and important, at least to philosophers, because philosophy, like I said, used to be akin to religion, something to die for, as Socrates did. Long before it was taught as an academic discipline, which I think ruins it, in universities. The philosopher follows the truth, and only the truth, with no care for how he is perceived, precisely because, as I'll show you when we do the episode on Book 7, he knows that the masses are all deluded and staring at shadows, and who would want their praise anyway? But the sophist makes a career of catering to the opinions and desires of these deluded masses, with essentially no regard for what is true. Glaucon continues, quote, For the things said indicate that there is no advantage in my being just, if I don't also seem to be just while the labors and penalties involved are evident. But if I'm unjust, but have provided myself with a reputation for justice, a divine life is promised. Therefore, since as the wise make plain to me, the seeming overpowers even the truth, and is the master of happiness, one must surely turn wholly to it, to seeming. As facade and exterior, I must draw a shadow painting of virtue all around me, while behind it I must trail the wily and subtle fox of the most wise Archilochus. You know, the idea of a wise fox. Basically, I have to be kind of a deceiving liar my whole life. Uh, listen to this. You've probably heard... But it's not just social media. As humans, it's always been a common temptation to value image over substance. According to a 2015 study in the Ecological Economics Journal, researchers found that consumers placed a social status signaling value of $587 on the hybrid Toyota Prius when compared with less unique looking hybrid cars. Basically, people are willing to pay more money for a strange looking car because of the social status it gives them. They prioritize a car that signals to their friends that they are environmentally conscious, regardless of what they actually do for the environment. Yeah, I mean, so most of you have heard this argument, but how hard is it to genuinely overcome it, right? Like, I, a lot of times my wife will sit around and say, like, she's not feeling like, you know, her she's living her best Oprah life or something. And I suspect part of it is because... She looks at Instagram, and on Instagram, all the women her age are posting these obviously staged photos of the one happy moment they had this month, you know, on Instagram, to be thought just, or virtuous, or good, or happy, or something like that. And so we all get caught up in this thing. It's very hard to sort of extract yourself from um, the world of, like, virtue signaling. All right, so I'll leave the point, but if you're, if you're almost in tears 
at this point, then you've maybe understood the tragedy of this reversal. <clears throat> All right, so this is where finally in book two, Socrates starts to work on a response, and his method does kind of drive me crazy, actually. Socrates says, quote, It looks to me as though the investigation we are undertaking is no ordinary thing, but one for a man who sees sharply. Since we're not clever men, in my opinion, we should make this kind of investigation of it. If someone had, for example, ordered men who don't see very sharply to read little letters from afar, and then someone had the thought that the same letters are somewhere else also, but bigger, in a bigger place, I suppose it would look like a godsend to be able to consider the, little, the littler ones after having read these first, if, of course, they do happen to be the same. And here, Adamantus kind of goes, well, what's the analogy? And Socrates says, there, quote, there is, we say, justice of one man, and there is surely justice of a whole city, too. And a city is bigger than one man, so perhaps it would be easier to observe closely justice in a city. Then, Socrates says, we'll also go on to consider it in individuals, considering the likeness of the bigger in the idea of the littler. End quote. So this is kind of annoying, right? Because like we're trying to get a beat on whether it's advantageous and actually good for, to be just as an individual, and then Socrates pulls our attention, and he says, instead, let's talk about justice in cities. And it's like, it's not a small digression here. This is going to be, we have to focus now on justice in cities for like five or six hours. I mean, the middle six books of the Republic, basically, <clears throat> and focus on essentially politics in city-states. And I wonder if the parallel is really that helpful. And so famously here, Socrates sees that a man has sort of three aspects to his self or soul. Reason, or the logos, and spirit, and his drives. And these are, these, these are the sort of famous tripartite division of the soul. And as an analogy, he also sees that a city has, and these correlate, Rulers, which correlates to the reason. Guardians, which correlates to the spirit. And laborers, which correlates to the drives. And this is the parallel that, you know, is enough for Socrates to sort of really go off on. Uh, but again, what so many readers of the Republic lose sight of is that all of the talk of the city-state stuff is really an analogy for thinking about justice in the individual man. So try to keep that in mind over my next couple of episodes when we're talking about, you know, justice in the city, that ultimately it has a parallel in the self, the local, smaller, littler self. Okay, <clears throat> then the men go into a bit of detail on what kind of men would be the best as guardians of the city. These are the spirited, right? The, the correlation with the spirit. And there's an interesting comparison here to like a dog who I think Adamantus says is angry at all strangers and warm to those he knows. And this suggests to the men in the dialogue here that the guardians need to love learning and wisdom for, they say, it is the knowing or the familiarity that makes the dog warm to his acquaintances and the not knowing that makes him hostile and angry at those he does not know. And so the, the guardian class, the spirit, should be interested in learning and wisdom. And so they begin to discuss how these guardians should be educated. What shall they learn? And they go on to agree that it's very important what tales a child hears when he is little. Socrates says, quote, We must supervise the makers of tales. And if they make a fine tale, it must be approved. But if it's not, it must be rejected will persuade nurses and mothers to tell the approved tales to their children and to shape their souls with tales more than their bodies with their hands. Most of those they know, sorry, most of those they now tell must be thrown out. Most of the stories they now tell must be thrown out, end quote. This might sound petty, but consider the trash that most of us allow to be pumped into our children's heads. And by the way, if you're thinking like, uh, oh, you'll never make that mistake until, you know, like, 
when you have kids. I mean, just wait until you have a two-year-old screaming at you constantly. It ain't easy to resist flipping on the Lion King or whatever so that your kid will stop yelling at you for an hour. But the question is, is the Lion King good enough to form this child's soul? Is it going to form a noble spirit in the kid? Maybe. I mean, maybe the Lion King's pretty awesome, I guess. But most of the tales we tell aren't going to be good for them. And so Socrates would probably form a censorship organization and basically nationalize Hollywood for the good of the people and ensure that no subversive or decadent messages ever reach our children. Do you ever hear how in the 19th century it was like there was well listen to this first Look, just listen to my audio clip I guess about reading novels this is one of those clips on YouTube of some like hipster looking guy with like a vague beard and glasses explaining why it's scientifically good for us to read novels if you're hearing a story about someone running, your motor cortex lights up and goes through the mental motions of running. It's easier to remember stories than plain old facts because to a certain extent, you're actually living the story. It's a phenomenon called grounded cognition. Yeah, yeah, man. It's like going to make it more real to you. I mean, he's like, I love how he uses like, it's a, it's a phenomenon called grounded whatever. It's like, okay, yes. I mean, he's he's not wrong in some sense. Reading stuff makes it, reading fiction, can make something realer to us. But what Socrates is on to is like, do, is this something that, may, the, the something that we're reading that's becoming more real to us, do we want it to be realer? So again, like, I've said this before on, like, on other venues or something, but like, this is that thing where you all grew up and watched a hundred Hollywood movies, and you've seen these depictions of social phenomena and interactions and stuff happening, but it's like maybe real life isn't like that, right? Maybe real life isn't a Jennifer Aniston movie. And so by internalizing it as more real, that's probably bad for you. And I think that's kind of what Socrates is trying to... He's on to here. And it makes some sense, at least. So Socrates doesn't love the Homeric epics and the poetry of Hesiod because he seems to be sort of like a genuine monotheist. He doesn't, I mean, like he wants to ban literature that shows gods taking on human form, using avatars, etc. Because he doesn't like how these gods in the Iliad or whatever work both good and evil. I mean, this, he thinks, will confuse children. Instead, as he says, the god is really good, end quote. And he, the god, the god must be said to be good. Okay, so we can, that's it. That's what we want to say about God. God is good. <clears throat> My sense is that Socrates then would ban stories about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and, ironically, all of the Greek myths. However, inter interestingly and incidentally, he might be okay with the story of Jesus because Jesus is shown to be only good and not a mix of good and bad. So that's kind of about it for book two. And just to give you a sense of continuity, book three continues on this question of education, and it reaches some really interesting conclusions. There's a lot of censorship talk, actually. <clears throat> Things like romantic fiction, tragic fiction, comedy, lewd or lustful fiction, all these should be banned. Because it, they all, they all like mislead us and, and set us up to understand life wrongly. Also, he says, there must be no anti-heroes. So no Breaking Bad or uh, the, the Sopranos or any of those sorts of narratives. And I, I think this like jives with the, maybe some of you will have heard this, the early like 19th century culture against novel reading, where serious people weren't supposed to waste their time on such tripe as novels because they were fake and they gave a fake impression of life. Of course, that culture lost, and now everyone's an idiot, kind of. Basically proving Socrates right, I suppose, right? We all waste our time reading fiction and looking at, like, TV shows and Hollywood, <clears throat> and we're all losing our minds for it. So yeah, maybe we need a censorship committee that only um, publishes what's good for, for people. Uh, but again, and sort of finally for this show, don't 
get lost in this as if it's really about training a class of guardians for the city. As I've said, this is actually about training yourself and becoming just yourself. It requires a process of elimination and purposeful censorship of wrong or misleading ideas. That is, you know, the logos within you, your reason, will have to be in charge of enforcing these restrictions on your spirit, just as the ruler of the city will have to make it illegal for the guardian class to read trashy literature. You got it? So you'll have to set some boundaries for yourself and restrict yourself to reading and listening to listening to only podcasts that are good for you, for example. Okay, so as I said, that's about it for this episode. Um, I think next episode we'll do book six of The Republic, and there we're moving on to discussing not the guardians of the city, but the rulers of the city. The These will have to be, this is the logos, the philosopher kings, the reason itself, right, and how we educate that. It's a different sort of a process. Um, uh, like I said, I mean, to me, I don't know, this whole thing about, in, in book two, the distinction between being just and seeming just really breaks my heart. Like, it really does, because I... <sighs> The older I get, the more it seems to represent the world as it sort of actually is. I mean, the people who, like, I I mean, I don't know, pick it out this week, right? Like the story about Rudy Giuliani or Hunter Biden or, like, Trump, I mean, Biden, all the, whoever is, like, considered to be, like, that's our guy, that's our ruler or whatever, they almost always have terrible demons, and it's like it seems to be because you don't make it that high up the ladder without being sort of an unjust person. And this is this is like tragic because it makes you realize that like our society is necessarily led by demons, and that's like not even the worst of the tragedy. I think the worst of it is that the true Mother Teresa, or like, I shouldn't say the Mother Teresa's, but like the true just men and women among us, like, are struggling to make a living, probably. Don't have friends or followers on Instagram. They're not influencers, you know? It's something I've thought about a lot lately, because like, I'm trying to, I mean, whatever, maybe I'm lying to you here. I suppose you can keep that in mind. But I'm like I'm trying to figure out is there a voice I can use is there a kind of podcast I can make is there a way to make content that's genuinely good and that isn't like shilling and it's not like basically I don't care if I only have 10 like listeners right and and like that's I guess that's good right like you you don't because that's better than doing like most of the podcasts that I looked at when I was thinking about making a podcast it's like People, you can get you can get twenty thousand listeners easy if you start a podcast on how to make money, and, and then you just like you know you, you just project this attitude of like, welcome listeners today. I'm going to teach you how to boost your income threefold in the next three months. Stay tuned, you know. And it's like, okay, I mean, well, I don't want to be that because that's phony and fake, and it's not real, and it's misleading, and it probably gives people a delusional idea of how to make it through the world. And so what I'm doing is trying to, like, make something real. But my guess is, you know, well, who knows? Maybe you guys will be awesome. And eventually you'll start, like, sending me your money and stuff. And virtue will be rewarded. But my impression is that probably instead what will happen is, you know, somehow, like, in spite of every effort to be good... It'll end up being like, you know, depicted as this is this is a negative, this is a bad podcast, he shouldn't be making this, right? Because that seems to be what happens in the world whenever anybody seeks the good and only the good, or like primarily the good, or seeks God, you could say, and God God alone, right? Like, I remember when I was younger, my dad used to always say to me, you know, uh, what's that, what's that, is it a Proverbs or Psalms or something like Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I guess that's actually, it seems like that's from Sermon on the Mount. And all these things will be added unto you or something, you know? So it's like, okay, I mean, good luck. Like, like good luck. To tell your 19-year-old who's going off to college to seek God only. And, and don't worry about getting a degree in engineering or a master's in business administration or something, you know? I mean, that's that, that's awesome of you. If you can do that, I just feel like most parents end up 
worrying more about their children's well-being and they sort of they might say like you know they might say keep going to church or something because notice that's a that's something that comes with a certain amount of social status at least in certain society right so that could be a that could be a thing that doesn't diminish your status or character but if you it's like if you're spending 3 hours a day meditating and lashing yourself trying to know god uh like your i my guess is most parents of a 20 year old truly going deep into the cave like that they're going to be worried for the kid they're going to be like this is bad and basically try to turn him into a cave dwelling shadow worshiping uh empire dweller you know moloch worshiper so that seems to be the problem that socrates is describing here in or or really that glaucon is describing in in chapter two and i don't really see a way around it um i mean i think what we do is hope for justice in the afterlife or something like that i guess that's the idea speaking of justice uh as good and and as well-intentioned as my show was, one of my early shows got uh, a, what do you call it, copyright strike for using, and do you guys know about this website called Classic Cat, where you can listen to classical music for free? It's been posted on the internet for decades. It's awesome. That's where I took that outro clip I was using from Handel's Messiah, but somehow it got a copyright strike, so... uh... Once again, goodness goes unrewarded, and I'm not going to be able to use that again, so you'll have to, for now at least, listen to the intro music as outro music, and I'll try to find something better um, uh, as outro music for the future. If anybody... Oh, I think, is my old friend Philip Daniel listening, and you want to send me like a 30-second outro, maybe I could use it. I don't know. Anyway... Okay, that was it for episode number five of the Godward Podcast. I'll see you next time. We'll do book six of Plato's Republic, and we'll talk more about educating. Bye-bye. It just feels wrong, doesn't it, this outro intro music? Bye.